Thanks so much, Vincent. I really appreciate it. And I especially appreciate being invited uh, to talk about this as a child neurologist. Um, I spent a lot of time learning about epilepsy because that's what we do. Um, and then I became a behavioral neurologist. And so I got very interested in um, autism spectrum disorder. So this is the perfect merge of my two uh, interests. I'm glad to see, I'm looking at the poll results now, um, and I geared this mostly for uh, lay people, not necessarily uh, other physicians or, or providers. So I'm glad to see I did that right, uh, since about 80% of us are, are not necessarily the, the uh, provider group. Um, and I will uh, use, I will try my best. And I think if you are uh, an autistic person, um, you will have heard this a million times before, but I will try my best uh, to uh, be respectful of the um, the uh, words I use. Um, I, as a physician, we've always been taught to not use um, disease or disorder specific language. So this is a switch for a lot of us. Um, but I will, uh, I will do my best. And if I do it wrong, I apologize. And, and it's, it's not for lack of trying. So um, let me, oops, my computer is not advancing my slides. Let me stop sharing for a second. Sometimes that does it. This happened to me the last time I gave a big presentation too. I don't really know why it happened. Sorry about that. Vincent, do you have my slides up? Oh, there we go. It just got unfrozen. I'm often frozen in my picture during this. There we go. Let me share again. Now, Vincent, are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. I'll try this again. Um, most of us, when we give talks, we have to do disclosure. I did um, point out here that I was a member of the DSM-5 Neurodevelopmental Disabilities Work Group, so that if you don't like the changes we made, you can blame me. Um, but hopefully, uh, I won't get too much uh, comment on that. Um, Today is the last day of November. Vincent asked me to do this in the month of November, and this just happened to be the one day that, it, that I was free, but I am wearing my purple for Epilepsy Awareness Month. And this came off of the Epilepsy Foundation website, um, so I wanted to uh, make a shout out to the last day of Epilepsy Awareness Month. Um, so here's what we're going to do today. I wanted to kind of introduce the concept of what it is that is this overlap between autism and epilepsy. I want to do a few definitions for those of you who don't know a lot of these words. Talk a little bit about the numbers, the prevalence, um, the risk factors, and kind of what it means. You know, what does it mean to have both of these disorders? Does it change one or the other? Um, and then because I know that this is a, a largely um, family or oriented audience, I wanted to talk a little bit about the practicalities of kind of what do you do um, and how do you make things better um, for people with both epilepsy and autism. Um, and then uh, at the very end, we'll talk a little bit about the science. I am not a basic scientist, um, but I've drawn some slides from a few other people. So hopefully those will be helpful to you. So the, the concept is that there is this overlap, right? This is the classic Venn diagram, um, that overlap between uh, people with epilepsy and, and those with neurodevelopmental disabilities. And, and autism is a good model for that. It's certainly not the only one. 
Um, but since uh, Spark is a large autism uh, sample, um, that's what we'll talk about today. So this association is relatively frequent. Um, we want to talk about it because it can have a major impact on the quality of life um, for the patient and the families. Um, and it can represent kind of common um, biological or, or in the brain neural mechanisms. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we get to the science part. So um, when I was in training, um, we learned a lot about epilepsy, as I said. And I have to tell you that a lot of the parents would say to me that the seizures themselves were not the big issue. Um, a lot of the issue was uh, difficulties with behavior, was difficulties with communication, were um, effects of the medications or of the seizures alone on cognition. Um, and that was a big, big deal for families. Um, and I think anybody with uh, either a provider or a parent or a family member of an autistic individual will also know that those are some of the big challenges. Um, so when you think about the overlap, one of the big questions that people come up with is, is there any causal relationship? In other words, if you're an autistic person, and you develop epilepsy, did the autism cause the epilepsy or will the epilepsy make the autism worse? Um, or the other way around, if you are somebody with epilepsy and you develop autism, did that mean that the epilepsy actually caused that autism to develop? Um, so that's the causal relationship, but there's also this kind of phenomenon that we call an epiphenomenon, which means they're true, true and kind of related, but one doesn't cause the other. So that would be that something in the brain, the way the brain developed, um, early uh, activity in the brain, different pathways in the brain, cause both of these things to happen. They may happen at different times, um, but they're both an underlying manifestation of this, this difference in the way the brain developed. And so that's kind of epiphenomenon. And that's important in terms of thinking about how we, how aggressive we want to be about treating one or the other, right, to avoid um, that cause kind of piece of it. So what you're going to hear a lot about today is uh, still questions, right? That we don't have answers to all of the questions. And, and I'll tell you why I think that is. This is my opinion. It's not, it's not God's truth, but um, I think there are a lot of challenges to doing uh, research in this area. One is the heterogeneity. You hear this all the time, right, of uh, autistic individuals and also of people with epilepsy. Um, you know, there are people who talk about the autisms and there are people in the epilepsy world who talk about the epilepsies, that one thing is not, it's, it's not one uh, disorder or one disease. Um, there's also the idea that there's a lot of different fields of investigation. So there's different people who do research in these areas. And unfortunately, they don't all talk to each other all the time. So for instance, there's behavioral scientists, psychologists, psychiatrists, um, uh, behavioral specialists that do a lot of work in the autism field, um, neurologists, neurosurgeons, um, brain specialists are the people who usually do uh, the epilepsy work. And then there's a ton of basic science, right, in both autism and epilepsy work. Um, and I would say that, that while these are uh, somewhat close together, they're not necessarily connected and we could probably do a better job in doing that. Finally, there are diagnostic differences. Um, so there are papers you'll read about um, people or autistic individuals with epilepsy or uh, autistic individuals with a single seizure. Turns out those aren't the same thing, and that's a definition, right? In the old days with DSM-4, where we had PDD-NOS, we had Asperger's, we had autistic disorder, um, those weren't defined in exactly the same way. The epileptologists don't always do an autism diagnosis. Right, so in, in an epilepsy clinic, what they're calling autism may or may not be what we call autism. So there's, there's diagnostic differences and that gets in the way as well.
So let me give you a few definitions for those of you who are not well, well ensconced in this. Um, the definition of a seizure is a sudden disruption of the brain's normal electrical activity, which is accompanied by altered consciousness and or other neurologic and behavioral manifestations. So the brain works on electrical activity. Um, that is how the brain cells communicate within a brain cell and across um, the, the connections between brain cells called the synapse. Um, sometimes that's chemical, sometimes that's electrical. And so there is a pattern in the same way that all of you, I think, are probably very well um, uh, acquainted with EKGs or ECGs, electrocardiograms. Um, there's also this idea of measuring the electrical activity, which is, sorry, which is measuring the electrical activity from the heart, but there's also this idea of measuring electrical activity from the brain. So you do an EEG and you see a specific brainwave pattern. Um, if there's suddenly a, abrupt onset, a change in that normal electrical activity, that's what we call a seizure. Um, Seizures can be either what we call provoked or unprovoked, and that is provoked by something that's happening at the time. Um, so high fevers will give some kids epilepsy or seizures. Um, some uh, some uh, aberrations in your blood chemistry. So if you lowered your blood sugar enough, you might have a seizure. If you changed your sodium level in your blood enough, you have a seizure. Um, so, uh, and there's a lot of those. So those we consider um, provoked seizures. Um, and then there can be unprovoked ones, which means that it's just a abnormal electrical activity in the brain. And that's, that's what the cause of it is. There are lots of different kinds of seizures. There can be those febrile seizures when you only have the seizure with fever. There can be um, what we consider the kind of main big seizure, which is generalized tonic-clonic, or you'll see the abbreviation of GTC, or people call this a convulsive seizure or convulsion. Um, these are the ones where you fall down, um, you get stiff, which is the tonic activity, and then you start to have some jerking motion, which is called the clonic activity. Um, and oftentimes the eyes will roll back in the head, there might be some frothing at the mouth or drooling, um, and the patient is very unresponsive. Um, there are smaller seizures. There are a bunch of different kinds of smaller seizures. So things like absence epilepsy or petit mal, which is the, the French word, um, which is just a staring spell. So it's the person will be taught. And then they'll start talking again. And just that five, six seconds is a little seizure, a little abrupt change in the brain's electrical activity. Um, there are focal seizures, and these used to be called complex partial seizures with or without impaired awareness. There's a whole new wording of things now, which a lot of us can't get in our heads because we've been using the old wording for so long. But um, focal with or without impaired awareness are um, seizures that start in one place in the brain, part or focus. Um, and they can either just be, say, a sensory experience where you feel something, or they can be a motor experience where your hand will twitch. Um, and you can be very aware of those, or it can, it can cloud your consciousness, and you, so you can be unaware. Um, there are other seizure names that are specific to certain seizure types, like infantile spasms, which is probably the most common uh, seizure in infancy, um, myoclonic seizures, which are just single jerk seizures, um, atonic seizures, which um, are also called drop attacks, where you kind of uh, lose the muscle tone, so not getting stiff, but actually getting limp and losing muscle tone. Tonic is the getting stiff ones, a prolonged seizure is called status epilepticus. So those are all words you might hear. What's epilepsy? So I just talked about seizures, but now you have to think about epilepsy. And the first thing I'll say is epilepsy is not a bad word. And epilepsy has gotten a really bad rap um, for a long time. There was a big kind of stigma um, of about having epilepsy. And so other people talked about it as a seizure disorder so that they wouldn't have to use the word. 
but epilepsy is a word. It just defines a condition characterized by recurrent seizures. So that means you have to have more than one. One seizure does not make you have epilepsy and they have to be unprovoked. So they have to be the ones that are just coming out of the brain for no other apparent reason. Again, there's lots of different kinds of epilepsy. There's temporal lobe epilepsy, there's childhood absence epilepsy, there's juvenile absence epilepsy, where you have more than just the staring spells. You can have the convulsive seizures or generalized tonic-clonic seizures. There's Rolandic epilepsy or something called benign epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes. So it tells you exactly which part, this is a focal seizure, tells you which part of the brain it's coming from. Um, and then there are epilepsy syndromes. I'm giving you one called Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, but there are lots of other epilepsy syndromes. So how do we diagnose it? Um, and this is really important. It's a clinical diagnosis and that's important. So what exactly, it, it really comes from the history. Um, so unless you have an EEG running when you have a spell, which almost never happens, um, we don't know for sure that it was seizure except for what you tell us. Um, so what exactly did the child, and I'm a pediatric neurologist, so that's why I'm talking about children, um, but the same is true for adults. What happened right before? What happened during the seizure and or the spell that you're worried about as a seizure? And what happened right after? So before, what were you doing ahead of time? One of the big things we get is, you know, was this a fainting spell or was this a seizure? And with fainting, there's a pretty known prodrome. You feel lightheaded. You feel like your vision's closing in. You feel maybe a little dizzy. Um, and those things happen. Those don't happen necessarily with a seizure. So that can help us determine is this, is this seizure or is this uh, fainting or syncope? Um, what happens during the seizure? And, and people will ask you this. Um, was, was there stiffening? Was one side of the body moving more than the other? What did the eyes look like? Were they pinned over to one side? Did they roll back in the head? Those kinds of things. Um, and then what happened after, um, which is, was the person totally back to their normal self? Um, or were they a little confused? Did they get tired? I have a couple families who say, I know my kid has a seizure because they had a um, nap in the afternoon. And this is a kid who never, ever, ever naps. And so if there's a nap, that's how they know they didn't see it because they didn't witness it, but the kid got up and went and took a nap. And so they say, I think there must have been a breakthrough seizure. Um, so the other way we diagnose epilepsy is with this EEG, which is this electroencephalogram, and it's a measurement of the brain waves. And what it looks like is, as I said, you're not usually lucky enough to be recording when you have a seizure. Sometimes with absence epilepsy, you can make it happen in the lab by having a kid blow on a pinwheel and, and hyperventilate a little bit. You can actually make it happen. Um, but most of the time we don't see the seizure while the EEG is running. Um, but what you can see is some background changes that make you think that this brain is more susceptible to having seizures, that there's extra electrical activity. It's a little bit more um, electrically active. So this is what an EEG looks like. Um, these areas right here are the kind of normal pattern where there's just little bits of, of electrical activity that are coming. This is reading from groups of cells and it's reading on the scalp. Um, and then you see this very rhythmic, um, very different looking thing. It gets very sharp. So you'll hear about things like spikes or sharp waves. Um, and then it gets a little bit less and it kind of slows down over here. So this is the after the epilepsy, after the seizure, sorry, after the seizure, you kind of have this slowing down. So what about numbers? How frequent is this? What we know is that epilepsy is increased in autistic individuals. 
So the thing that we don't know is exactly how often. And the reason for that is that the published rates, and right, we're all scientists, we all go by the published literature, is hugely variable. I mean, five to 45 percent. Right, that's ridiculous. 5% is very different than 45%. So how is it that there's stuff in the literature that still says only 5% of individuals with autism have epilepsy and, and others say half? Well, it's probably dependent on the sample. So I wanted you to know it's not just that we don't get it and we don't know what we're doing. It's probably dependent on the sample. So if you look, population-based samples have lower rates than clinic-based samples. Well, that kind of makes sense. If you're in a neurology clinic or better yet, an epilepsy clinic, and you count how many people with autism in your clinic have epilepsy, well, why are they in your clinic? because they have epilepsy. So you're gonna get much higher rates, right? Turns out also that there's a, a two, kind of two humps in terms of when seizures come about in early childhood and adolescence. So if you look at a much younger sample where you haven't gotten all of those, those individuals in adolescence who might start to have seizures later, if you're not including those, you get a lower rate. Um, there was a paper about 10 years ago that said actually probably over half have their seizure onset after age 10. So they're in that later adolescence group. And I'll tell you, in my clinical experience, it's been later than what you would expect. A lot of people think it's puberty, right? They think it's hormones and that's the reason for it. And so you'd see it in 11, 12, 13, 14 year olds. I see it in 17, 18, 19, 20 21 year olds. So that's the first time that you might have a seizure. Um, if you have autism plus, which a lot of kids do, right? They have autism because of brain injury, because of a genetic syndrome. Um, depending on what those things are, you might have more epilepsy in those cases. And then it's quite well known, I would say, almost every paper out there in the literature will say that with lower IQ and intellectual disability, that has a bigger uh, uh, effect on epilepsy. There's a little controversy about whether um, kids who had that autistic regression early on in life or um, have poor language skills, whether that actually predicts the development of epilepsy. There are some papers that say yes and some papers that say no. So I pulled this out of a, a paper that I did with um, one of my fellows a few years ago, and it's not something that's really important to you. The only reason that I wanted you to see it is, is just here's the column that has epilepsy rate, right? And I just wanted you to see how often things are different. So here's one with 46%. So here's what I think is happening. This is the ascertainment bias. This is a clinic based. 46%, and these are population-based, closer to 10%, okay? Here's the effect of age. Here's a lower rate in a sample that has a mean age of only seven and a half, right? Here's an adult population. You almost double your rate. Um, here's the effect of the syndrome or intellectual disability. Here's with intellectual disability, 21%, without 8%. Um, this was a group where they called it essential or complex autism, which we think means that there was a comorbid condition in the complex. And again, you have almost a doubling. There's also overlap between certain epilepsy syndromes and autism, and that kind of gives us a clue about some of the shared mechanisms. So infantile spasms, I told you, were a common, um, well, common in infancy um, as a seizure type. It's not common for many infants to have spasms. But if you look at them, um, these are early seizure onset. Um, oftentimes that disrupts development. They have later uh, intellectual disability and developmental issues. Um, but the social communication actually is even a little bit worse than you would expect for the IQ. So there's something about having those early seizures 
that disrupts the social piece of the brain and predisposes to autism. If you look at a whole group of spasms, they say somewhere between 10 and 15% will go on to develop autism. Um, and if you look backwards in people with autism, some of them had spasms. And if you look at autism and epilepsy, almost a third of them had spasms. Um, tuber sclerosis complex is a, is a rare uh, monogenic disorder um, where they have very high rates of epilepsy and quite high rates of uh, autism. Um, and uh, it seems not every person with tuber sclerosis develops either epilepsy or autism, but if you're going to develop the autism, um, it's higher in those with intellectual disability. There is a syndrome called Lando-Kleffner syndrome. This is actually a very rare syndrome um, that is uh, language and behavioral regression. So um, pretty typically developing and then all of a sudden you have this wake up in the morning and you don't understand any language anymore. And if you go looking, there are some EEG abnormalities that you sometimes see in kids with autism as well. And so there's some overlap maybe here with Linda Kleffner and this kind of more typical autistic regression um, that, that some of our patients uh, have presented with. There is no one single epilepsy syndrome. We talked about seizure types before, the generalized convulsive, the partial focal, the absence. Um, some seizure behavior is this period of unresponsiveness. We talked about eye deviation um, with focal seizures. Sometimes you can have a repetitive behavior or an automatism. Um, and when I give talks uh, to parents, I'll have 17 people lined up saying, I think my child's seizing all the time because what do you see? Not responding to your name, peering out of the corners of your eyes, uh, specific stereotypes. These are all pretty common behaviors in autism. So even good epileptologists sometimes have a hard time telling the difference between seizure and autistic behavior in some patients. What I would tell you is that I think the seizure behavior is involuntary and I think the autistic behavior is a little more voluntary. So there's ways to determine whether the child is truly unresponsive or not. And the way I suggest to people is not just calling their name because that's a that's an, almost a diagnostic criteria of autism is that they don't always answer to their name. So you get right in their face, you do something like this or you touch. And it turns out if somebody touches your nose and you're not expecting it, it's really annoying. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> I don't suggest to people that you pinch somebody, but I just say touch your nose or blow in their face. Those are very annoying things. And if they do something purposeful during that time, that's not true unresponsiveness. You can't stop a seizure that way. So that's a pretty good uh, rule of thumb. So what are the risk factors? I think we've talked a lot about this. Intellectual disability, the comorbid conditions. Turns out female gender is actually, um, there are more than the, the kind of four to one ratio of males to females. The, the females have about half of the, of the epilepsy in autism. So you wouldn't actually expect that. Um, as I told you, the developmental regression is, we're not really sure about that. There are some papers that say yes and some papers that say no. Um, there was a nice paper that was done a few years ago of a big birth cohort study. And they found, um, and this is across everyone, they found a certain out of 4,700 babies, they found a certain percentage that had autism, and then a certain percentage of those ended up with epilepsy. And it turned out if they were premature or if they had low APGAR scores suggesting a difficult delivery or low birth weight, that, that um, increased the risk of epilepsy. So what does this mean? Well, it means that you have to treat them um, and are they easy to treat or hard to treat? This is one paper, it's kind of the only one I can find about the, the treatment. Um, it was a paper that came out of uh, a big tertiary epilepsy center in New York. Um, and they said the treatment kind of difficulty refractory um, was actually um, a third of the kids. So they said it was relatively common. I'll tell you in my clinical experience as a child neurologist, 
um, I see most of the kids doing pretty well. Um, so it's, it's usually pretty easy to treat epilepsy. Um, and so even in a tertiary care place where you're going to see most of the really hard to control epilepsies, they only had a third of them that had difficult to control epilepsy. So I think that's a good sign. This next one's a little more scary, right? Um, it probably increases mortality in autism. We know in autism, most of the time there isn't, there's a full life. This is not a disorder that, that shortens lifespan. But with epilepsy, it can. These are data that were pulled from the California um, Department of Developmental Services, and they found that there was a five to six time higher mortality in those with autism plus epilepsy than with autism alone. Now, I will tell you that if you also looked in the epilepsy alone, it was even higher. So again, I think that that tells you that most kids with epilepsy and autism are actually relatively easy to control. And the, the kids who, who have death associated with their epilepsy are the, the kids who have very, very severe epilepsy. I found one paper years ago, and again, I can't find more on this that says it may impact the outcome of early intervention. And again, this was a very young sample. So these were kids who probably started their epilepsy in, in infancy. Um, and epilepsy, among other medical problems, were associated with kind of lower scores in adaptive function and how much you could do in your communication and your, in your socialization and your adaptive skills. So I don't know what to make of that. I'm going to put in um, here uh, the, the definition of SUDEP. And the reason I put it here um, is I think it's important, but I think it's really, really important to know it's very rare. It's a complication um, that you'd need to kind of know about if your child has epilepsy or your loved one has epilepsy, you need to know about this. It's a very rare complication. It's sudden unexplained death in epilepsy. It's exceedingly rare in children. So one in 4,500 or 0.002%. Um, we don't actually know the cause. Um, there are people who are looking at uh, whether it's a breathing problem, whether it's a, an actual brain um, cessation of activity, um, whether it's a cardiac problem. Um, so the cause is still unknown. It usually happens at night and you wake up in the morning and, and the person has passed in their sleep. Um, and so oftentimes it's unwitnessed right? So, so you don't know. Sometimes there's evidence that there was a seizure um, in the night, but you don't always know that. What you do know, what we do know is that the risk increases with having those big convulsive seizures. Um, focal seizures are not as much of a risk. Absence seizures, I don't think are any risk at all. Um, and with not taking medication. So those are the two ones that we know about. And so those are things that hopefully we can do something about, right? Where um, we can work with our providers and say, we need to get better control of the, of the seizures here um, so that we're at less risk of SUDEP. So I raise it because I think for a long time, we didn't talk about it um, because it was so rare and then families really felt betrayed when we didn't talk about it and it happened to them in that rare case. They said, you never told me that this could happen. So there's a lot more awareness of it now. Um, and I think if you look in the, in, on websites and that kind of thing, it's just an important thing to know about. So what do we know about epilepsy and the, and the autism? Um, and I'd say really not very much. And here I'd point to the idea of the epileptologists are not that interested in, in the autism symptoms and the, and the autism symptom guys are not that interested in the epilepsy. Um, but there's been a couple little studies and it, and it looks as if the epilepsy on top of autism probably is associated with more um, challenges, more deficits. Um, so lower social scores in one, um, more medication use, which would 
and this isn't epilepsy medication, this is probably behavior medication. Um, there was one study that used something called the DISCO, which is a big, long interview they do um, that was started in Europe and is used a lot in Europe, not so much in the United States. Um, where they had, uh, they ask a million questions. It's, I think it was written by a Brit. So this is the one I love. Um, there were several items on the social interaction scale, like they, people with autism and epilepsy had more socially shocking behaviors. I don't actually know what those are, but um, I thought that was interested on the nonverbal communication, staring too long and too hard. So maybe less less well modulated eye contact. I'm not sure that tells us a lot, um, but I think this is something that's that's ripe for us to do a better job with understanding um, how it affects the the autism symptoms. Um, I will tell you this is something I've been interested in, and I I was uh, lucky enough to supervise a, a lovely woman named Emma Viskiti who um, did her dissertation. She's a statistician, and she was doing a dissertation on this, um, and she looked at a big a bunch of of samples of people with autism, some of whom had epilepsy. Um, so that AGREE sample that you heard about, the Autism Genetic Resource Exchange, uh, the Boston Autism Consortium, the Simon Simplex Collection, the predecessor to the SPARC trial. Um, the strengths of these samples were that they had really good autism diagnosis. They had really good behavior data. Um, the weaknesses, the epilepsy data was eh, it was okay. It was kind of, you know, did your child ever have, have a seizure? Um, and the initial analysis, I was so excited as she was presenting these things to me before she published. She said, um, I really, I found that there are more kids with epilepsy and autism had a regression, that there was um, worse language, um, lower IQ, worse adaptive function, even ASD severity seemed to be um, related. And then because she's a statistician, she actually did some of her magic with statistics and found out it was almost all gone after adjusting for the for the IQ. So it seemed to be really related to IQ. So here's from her paper, these this is an unadjusted unadjusted uh, analysis. These are, are um, statistical values. If you're less than 0.01, it means it's real. Um, it means it really means something. Um, if you look when you start to um, adjust, I don't know, my, my picture is clouding this one, but it turns out the only things that mattered were age, which we knew about, um, and IQ. Everything else went away. So in reality, I think there are probably multiple kinds of epilepsy and autism. I think when the early onset seizures actually contribute to developing autism, so that's like with the infantile spasms patients. I think when other disorders coexist, so neurogenetic syndromes like tuberous sclerosis, fragile X syndrome, uh, the dupe 15 q Alliance has done a lot of work in this. Um, this is a, a pretty common copy number variation within um, autism spectrum disorder with a high rate of autism and a pretty high rate of epilepsy, much higher than that 10 or 20% that I told you from the, from the um, population-based samples. And then probably even true idiopathic autism. So this is no regression, no language problems, no IQ problems, just autism has an increased risk. Turns out there are also epileptiform abnormalities, even without clinical seizures. And that's a controversy that we won't really get into, but I just kind of wanted to let you guys know this. The rates, again, are quite variable. Um, because why, if you don't think somebody has seizures, why would you bother to get an EEG here, right? Um, early days, uh, this is uh, one of my former mentor, men mentors, Isabel Rappin, who's kind of the grandmother of child neurology and, and autism. Um, and she had a big sample of patients from her clinic at Montefiore, and she got EEGs on a lot of them, and 14% and had, had these changes. 
Um, and then if you looked at it, the ones with epilepsy, you were kind of expecting it, but the ones without epilepsy, you weren't. And it turned out of the kids without epilepsy, even 8% had some of these changes on their EEGs. If you look at later studies, they had even higher rates. And if you look at overnight studies, which is the way a lot of people like to do things because a regular EEG is hard, um, you have uh, even higher rates, up to 60% sometimes. So let's talk a little bit about the practicalities. One is treatment. Um, you know, how do we treat this? Well, it turns out that which drugs you choose um, depend on seizure type. Um, they also depend on the side effect profile of the drugs and the practicalities because what if your child only drinks clear things like water, right? You can't give them a liquid medicine because they'll notice it. Um, so in that case, you have to do food. Um, and there are sprinkle caps that you can put in food. Um, it turns out that the dosing schedule, we'd all like, if your kid really hates taking medicine, we'd all like to have a once a day drug, right? That would be a good thing to do. And then some of these medicines require blood draws more often than others because there are more problems, um, side effects that, that come um, from the medication. So you need to know about that. Um, all seizure medications, all can have behavioral and cognitive effects. And so that's just an important thing to know. And your doctor hopefully will, or your practitioner will think about that because we don't want to give people with autism or autistic people more behavioral challenges. Um, I will mention just because I think it's hot um, and it's hard not to talk about is uh, the interest in CBD or in cannabis. Um, and uh, there was right, there is right now an FDA approved medication called Epidiol X um, purified CBD um, that was approved because it worked for um, a very severe form of epilepsy called Dravet syndrome. It's also, uh, they did another trial with the lennox gasto syndrome that I told you about. Um, there are people who are using CBD in autism as well that we do not have clinical data for yet. Um, that's probably a whole other webinar that they're probably planning at some point. Um, but there is a trial that's going on right now in epilepsy and autism. And the idea is not just looking at the seizures, but also looking at the behavior. Does giving these um, medications improve behavior at, at all? Um, I will tell you, for those who just have the EEG abnormality, whether you treat those is controversial. So we're taught to treat the child, not the test, right? Not the, just the EEG. And the only time we really focus on EEG is with that lendo kleffner syndrome or, or infantile spasms. It turns out if you don't fix the EEG in those cases, the, the efficacy of your treatment is not very good. But there's really almost no data in autism. And I think that's very, very important. There are clinicians who do it, and I count myself sometimes, not always, but um, among those clinicians. Um, and I think it's a very important conversation to have with your provider about whether you think starting a medication um, to try to do something without the data there is, is worth doing. Um, I will tell you um, that typically people will use anticonvulsants or anti-seizure um, medicines. Um, so valproate, which is Depakote, uh, Lamotrigine, Lamictal, uh, different benzodiazepines have these um, abilities to actually suppress the spikes, suppress that abnormal electrical activity in the brain. Um, there are also people who are using atypical treatments like steroids, um, which can be used in infantile spasms or in lando kleffner syndrome. Um, there's even a couple case reports of epilepsy surgery. This is really not recommended. Um, and, and I'm a little surprised that, that it even made it into the literature, but um, just so you know. Um, I want to tell you a little bit, and I'm, I'll go through fast here because I want to get to the science and leave a little time for questions, but um, getting an EEG is a challenge in kids on the spectrum. And so, um, you know, a routine EEG, we want to try to get sleep. 
during during the EEG because that's sometimes when some of the abnormalities come out more than when you're awake. Um, so what do you make the patient do so that they might be sleepy when they come into the lab the next day is they need to be sleep deprived. Well, that's not easy for anybody to do. And then you sleep deprive them, they only get four hours of sleep that night and then you put them in the car seat on the way into the lab and what do they do? Take a nap and then they're never gonna take a nap in the lab. Um, during, there's lots of head touching. You need to stay still so that things aren't moving around too much. There's a lot of smells, there's sounds, and then you're supposed to go to sleep. So some of our kids never sleep anyway, right? And so I'm definitely gonna do that after somebody's been messing with my head um, and I'm in a small room with some smell of tape and glue. So not easy to do, right? Um, so there are a lot of people out there who are working to help prepare. Um, and so knowing what's going to happen, you know, even getting a tour of the EEG lab. So it's not the first time you've ever been there. Um, our child life specialists work. Um, we, we've gotten the EEG text to give us all the old broken electrodes and we send them out to you in a little packet. And you can have your ABA therapist or your occupational therapist actually practice um, using the equipment. So we also have a social story. I'm giving you this one because Children's has these um, and, uh, and this is our outpatient visit here and these will be posted. So here's the link. I'm sorry, it's such a long one, um, but this is in a, a preparing for your visit, um, which were done by, um, by the staff in our Autism Spectrum Center and our child life specialist. So I'll give you a couple um, prints of this. So this is a, introducing the technologist and then here he has to lie still and they're gonna start by measuring because measurement, think about trying to get your kid's head circumference done. It's not always easy. They have to measure a lot more than just around because they need to know where to put the electrodes. Then they have to actually draw with a little grease pencil so that they know where those electrodes are going. Then they have to clean it off with a Q-tip um, and that feels kind of weird because it's got a little abrasive on it to get a good seal. Um, and then they start to put the electrodes down. There's a little paste underneath and then they have to put a, um, a piece of tape on top. Um, so I think having these, these are specific to what our lab looks like, but I think a lot of places have um, uh, um, social stories like this and you can find them on the web. So I wanna to try to get through a little bit of the science in the last five minutes and leave some time for questions. Um, we think there are common mechanisms, right? And these mechanisms can be anywhere from big pathways in the brain. I think probably those of you who've been looking at the autism field for, for any length of time know that some people talk about it as a disconnection syndrome where there's kind of over connectivity, too much connection between little areas close to each other and maybe not as much as we expect in these long range pathways. Um, front to back. Um, how about at the level of the cells? So we think about this disorder as a disorder of the synapse, that is the, the connection between the two cells. Um, we also think about it um, in that the brain cells have a level of excitation. That's how they fire. Um, and, and there's excitation and there's inhibition, right? There's, there's the positive and the negative. And there are a lot of people who think that in, in those with autism spectrum disorder, there's some kind of imbalance between that excitatory and inhibitory um, kind of yin yang. Um, and it may happen during a critical brain, uh, critical period of brain development. And then if you look all the way down to the genes, there's a lot of overlapping genes and regions. I'll show you a schematic of here. Um, oh, let me, I, I borrowed these slides from, from a colleague who now is the chair of, uh, of neurology at Penn, um, but was one of our uh, developmental epileptologists for a long time, Frances Jensen. And she had a real interest. She was understanding the development of epilepsy and she started to see things that made her think there's so much overlap in the things that I'm looking at in development of epilepsy and also the development of autism. So she talked about both occurring in the critical period, 
both involving the synapse, right? That connection between neurons, both um, being disorders of activity dependent pathways. It turns out that the way your cells fire change the way they will fire later on. It's activity dependent. Um, there's evidence for epilepsy in human autism syndromes and in animal models. And from a basic science standpoint, seizures can dysregulate, it, dysregulate some of these autism related protein cascades. Um, and this is getting into the basic science. So I hope you don't ask me because I am not a basic scientist. But here's a great just uh, picture. Here's in seizure, you can have milliseconds where you open a channel or not. You can have seconds where the, the neurotransmitter floats across and, and makes that second cell fire. Then you can have things that take a little bit longer. So you have minutes to hours, which are changes that happen in the brain just because one cell fired to the other. And what she's showing here is that a lot of the genes here are genes that are involved in um, the things that we've been talking about. So West syndrome is infantile spasms. Lysencephaly is another uh, uh, seizure disorder. Tuberous sclerosis we talked about with mTOR. Fragile X syndrome, the FMRP. Angelman syndrome is a, is a deletion at DUP15Q. Um, and MECP2 is the gene for Rett syndrome. So all of these have downstream pathways in the cells that we actually know a fair amount about. And I think that's very exciting because we're getting to the point where we actually can maybe design mechanistic therapies. So if we focus on some of these specific syndromes, we can look at that mechanism. Okay, so I'm going to give you one example from animal models, which is um, you make a mouse that has the gene um, uh, mutation for tuberous sclerosis complex. It's not a person with tuberous sclerosis, but it's a mouse. And they looked and said, um, uh, if you treat very early with some of these specific chemicals that go in that pathway, you might actually be able to prevent the development of epilepsy, which is a huge deal, right? So now take this to the autism piece. And what if you prevented the epilepsy? Does it also reduce the risk of, of autism in the people with tuberous sclerosis? And I want to tell you that they're actually doing a trial like this that's going on right now. Um, there's also this idea of altered excitatory inhibitory balance. So it's seen in a lot of the mouse models in autism. Could you alter this? Could you give a medication early? Could you increase the inhibition, decrease the excitation? Some of the medicines that we use in autism do exactly that. Those are the neurotransmitters that they work on. And if that would help, when do you have to do it? Is that something that has to be done early, early, early? Can it be done after two or after three when the, when the autism is already uh, developed and been diagnosed? I think we don't know the answer. There's lots of clinical research questions. These are ones I have interest in, but, but there are a million others. Um, and I think, you know, here's my, my final slide, which is, these are the things that I think we need to work on, right? So from a clinical standpoint, we need to get a better idea of the prevalence and symptom descriptions. We need to develop targeted treatments. And that kind of comes from knowing the genetics, knowing these basic molecular mechanisms and, and doing this kind of pathway analysis. So here's my take home. It's increased. It's probably not. The, the textbooks will tell you it's about 30%. I don't think that's true. I think that I think the best estimate are the population-based studies, which say somewhere more between 10 and 20, but it's way higher than the general epilepsy risk. So, so there's definitely an overlap here. All seizure types are possible. Some are hard to tell from autistic behaviors. I would tell you I, from my experience, I think it's usually not severe, but it certainly can be. Um, and the risk factors include the intellectual disability, uh, gender of being a girl, um, other having another syndrome. And there is this overlapping biology, which I think is going to lead us to targeted treatments.
So I went a little bit over. I think we have about five or six minutes for questions now. And I think Vincent was going to try to collate some of those. I know I'm a provider. I'm sure a lot of you are going to ask me specific questions about your kids, which I hope you realize we can't necessarily answer. But um, hopefully there'll be some general questions that I can answer now. So thanks for your attention. Oh, and if I didn't point out, I'm wearing my purple. It was the only purple I had for uh, Epilepsy Awareness Month. Thank you so much. Um, we did get uh, quite a number of questions that were specific to, um, uh, you know, one child situations, but I did try to pull together some, some general ones. Um, can you talk a little bit about any of the known triggers for seizures? Yes. So um, I, I, that's a great question. I'm going to write myself a note for my next time I give this talk. I will stick that in. We do know that um, anybody with epilepsy, so that is the, the chance of unprovoked, more than one unprovoked seizure, um, still having a fever makes it worse. Fever lowers your seizure, seizure threshold. Say that five times fast. Um, and so when you're sick, um, some of my parents will tell me that I, they, they know that their kid is sick because they break through with a seizure when they hadn't had one in months and months and months. And so it doesn't happen. The sickness doesn't come until the next morning, but they wake up in the, in the night with a seizure and then they're sick the next day. Um, so being sick is one. Sleep deprivation is another, which is a huge problem for um, patients with autism, right? I know Spark has actually done a, a webinar on sleep problems. Um, uh, uh, low blood sugar and different kind of chemical imbalances in the body um, also matter. Um, there are some people with what we call photosensitive seizures, so flashing lights. Um, that is not true for most people. And you will learn from your own child if your child has epilepsy, when they do the, the EEG, they actually flash a light. And if you have what's called that photoparoxysmal response, in other words, the, the flashing light makes you have some of those spikes, you know that that's something that you have to be really careful about. So people always ask me, does video games make my kids' seizures worse? Um, and it, it's not that common, but it does happen. So those are the, those I think are kind of the big triggers. Okay, thank you. Um, and someone was asking about uh, seizures during sleep and if there's any technology that's available to monitor that. Yeah. So um, many seizures, why do we want an EEG during sleep? It turns out that what happens to the brain during sleep is that instead of, this is a perfect slide for me to end on, this looks very different than this one, right? Which looks very different from this one. These are the areas of the brain, right? That, are, that they're recording from. So in general, when you're awake, all of your different brain parts are supposed to be doing something different. When you start to go to sleep, there are times when it all segregates. And so it's in that time, and that's on purpose, um, but it's in that time that if you're going to have a problem with this idea of firing all at once, which you shouldn't usually do, um, that's the time that they come out. So on the way to sleep, waking up, um, sometimes during deep sleep, um, we see some of these discharges come out. And so it's not surprising to us that we see seizures out of sleep a lot. The question is, is can you do anything about it? There are lots of things out there now. Um, there are pads, uh, there are pillows, there are watches. Um, you know, this is, a, a, I have a just regular old Fitbit, but there are ones that have been um, for seizure detection devices. Um, that kind of try to detect whether something's happening or not. Um, there are not great data about most of these things, although they're really working hard on the, on the watch. Um, and I think it might even be, uh, it might even be approved for seizure detection now. The question is, is how does it tell you as a parent who's not in the room? <laughs> Um, and I'm, I just, I don't know that because I haven't, I haven't kept up with that literature, but, um, but there, but there is, there are some seizure detection um, devices now. Yes. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so I do want to be respectful of time. So let's just do one more question if you're okay with it. Sure. Um, and I know that we got a ton of questions um, in the chat, so I'm sorry that we couldn't get to them all. But um, so is there any move toward earlier screening for genetic um, forms of epilepsy? So that's a great question. I think that, um, you know, when I was in training, we never did genetic testing for epilepsy. And now I would tell you that almost every tertiary care center has an epilepsy genetics clinic. So yes, I think there is a lot of, uh, there's, there's a lot of interest in that. I think that one of the first things that is done when you get a diagnosis of, of epilepsy now, regardless of whether you have autism or not, is this idea of doing a, a genetic panel. Some people are getting to the point, there are, there are lots of gene panels out there. It's sometimes hard to get insurance to pay for them. They're getting to the point where whole exome sequencing is the way to go. Um, a lot of people are saying that's actually just a better way to go than bothering with the gene panels. Um, so part of Spark, I'm sure, I can't, I'm not, a, not an investigator on Spark, um, but I'm sure that they are looking at some of these epilepsy genes along with um, all the genes that, that we think may predispose you to autism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then just one more, sorry, because uh, maybe some other families have had issues with this. If someone had to get EEG results while the child was standing, is it still gonna be an accurate read? Yes. So okay. I think the idea of, you know, the more you can get the text to do um, different things. So we have our child life specialist. We do trainings with our EEG techs. Um, we try to let them sit up rather than laying down if it, that's going to be a big problem for them. Um, so the, the problem I will tell you from, from hearing from the techs is that as they're doing things, um, they have to kind of push the kid's head. And so if they're sitting up or standing up, that's a little bit more difficult for the, the technologist to actually get it in the right place, right? Where when you're lying down, they can hold your head a little bit more still. So that's the big issue. Um, but yes, the more we can do for accommodations and kind of thinking outside the box, um, the better off I think we're going to be. Okay. Great All right. Question. Well, thank you so much. This was really helpful. We got a lot of great comments from, from people that were in attendance.